Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar uh, on future of urban agriculture, culture and community. I'm Maya Kale, and I will be the moderator of today's session. Uh, this webinar is part of a bigger project that is funded by Nordic Council of Ministers, and the project aims to link the Nordic and Baltic knowledge and know-how on urban agriculture, and also produce a case study report that is done by our partners, Nordregio. And today we have a great panel of esteemed uh, speakers who will talk about the aspects of culture and community when it comes to urban agriculture. And um, after short presentations, uh, we will have a discussion. And all of you who are following this webinar online, you're welcome to send in your questions. We will have the opportunity to read them and answer. Uh, with this, uh, let's uh, let's start with the first presentation, and uh, Mom will uh, tell about uh, her experience uh, in uh, Finland. But let me shortly introduce Mom. Mom is an architect involved in urban gardening at Dodo since 2010, and she's interested in the many shapes and sizes of urban gardening and how it can be implemented, from the windowsill to the community gardens in solitude or together with others, as guerrilla actions or in dialogue with the city. Mom, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Maya. Yeah, all this volunteering work has led me so that I'm now the head of organizational development at Dodo in Helsinki. So, see. Dodo is an urban environmental NGO founded in 95, and our main themes are food and urban gardening, urban planning and building, global development and climate. I'm now focusing on the first one, so food and urban gardening, and here especially uh, our urban gardening center turntable located in Pasila, one stop with the train from Helsinki Central Railway Station. Uh, it's in an area that's currently uh, undergoing big den densification as railway areas are built in. The Urban Gardening Center turntable is located uh, at the in the middle of this roundhouse uh, on an actual old turntable that was taken out of use already in 1999. And the greenhouse was built here in 2012 and, and was part of the Helsinki Design Capital that year. So last year we celebrated 10 year anniversary. And uh, yeah, this will be the 12th season now at Turntable this year. Um, Turntable is a lab for sustainable food production and urban planning, as well as a center for peer learning and urban culture. Uh, these aspects are brought forth in bi-monthly urban dinners, waste food events, as well as um, bigger yearly events, such as harvest in autumn and smaller work parties. Like here is a group looking at the um, B um, boxes at turntable. We've had them, yeah, since 2012. And then it's exciting every spring to see like, oh, have they survived this uh, winter? We lost one of our two boxes, but one uh, survived for, for this summer. So yeah, the, the bees then help pollinate in the garden and also they yeah collect um, and make honey from a wider area. And so the central goal uh, of turntable is to increase adaptability of citizens by rising both the degree of self-sufficiency in food and um, the a variety of civic skills. So we use the space for like uh, meetings, lectures, um, discussions, workshops, courses. I run this spring a course on ABC on urban gardening. Uh, specifically for unemployed uh, people. So as a means of like, yeah, starting something, learning something new and learning skills you can also use to to, to grow some uh, food. And also we have yes, space for people to then come and join workshops and actually do the things also during summer. Um, yeah, Turntable brings together um, uh, people from different walks of life. Um, 
the main focus group is young adults and especially in recent years uh, there's more and more non-Finnish speakers joining who are recent who have recently moved to Helsinki as we've started to to have our communications in both Finnish and English so that's attracted uh, like like-minded people uh, and also like to socialize around food gardening and and parties is a good way to like uh, get connected and we also always bring then also the themes of sustainability uh, into the mix with discussions, workshops, and alike, um, and and work to find like tools um, to work for a better future. So then uh, this like a tagline that I, I I wrote the urban gardening so seeds of urban change. Um, there's like many levels to it, I think, because uh, it yeah, all starts with these tiny, small seeds um, that you get out there, you get growing and, and water them, hope rain uh, and, and look, look at them grow and, and get bigger. In the same way, like these like, ideas also act as seeds that, that you can share and, and spread and get growing in people's minds. Um, so then also, uh, yeah, the seeing, seeing the seeds start to grow, you also start to see the city in a different way, like what's already growing there, like um, fruit trees, berry bushes, edible wild herbs, and, and you start to look at the surroundings in a different way. So, uh, so you can walk the same path from home to school or work and, and see, see the um, place in a different way light and see like what's growing there what what could be harvested what could be used uh, and then of course the ripple effects of sharing this uh, getting others involved and changing uh, the city on a bigger scale uh, growing out like that I, I feel i run through the presentation i wonder how much i have time <laughs> or if i should uh, save that for the the discussion part then Thank you so much, Mom, for introducing uh, different kind of activities and also purpose. And I loved your uh, quote that see uh, that the urban gardens are seeds uh, of urban change. And uh, thank you so much for that. We will definitely discuss more both the gardening, the technical aspects, but also these uh, aspects of ideas as um, uh, where you also need uh, seeds and, and, and grow them. Thank you so much. Uh, as the next uh, presentation, we will hear from Riga City Council uh, and Martin is representing that. Uh, Martin is an urban research researcher who has been working with culture, tourism and urban topics for the last 15 years and currently working for the Riga City Development Department. Martin has a bachelor's in news, new media art, master's in international tourism management, and now he studies for another master's in spatial development planning. So kind of serious master studies <laughs> student. Uh, he, Martin has worked at the Icelandic Tourism Research Center, Danish Cultural Institute, Latvian Investment and Development Agency, as well as the Rick C the Center for New Media Culture. So it kind of made sense to invite Martin to this Nordic Baltic event because you are such a Nordic Baltic person yourself. So the floor is yours. Yeah, I really hope. Um, yeah, hello, my name is Martin Schengelis. You may also know me from such TV shows as Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad and Succession, but I'm also working on a on a regular people's basis at the city development department. And uh, my story today is, um, no, it's too far. Yeah, my story, um, hmm, interesting. Yeah, my story is about La Stadia and it's an interesting uh, place in, in Riga and, and I'm gonna explain you the long road of a cultural community garden. And uh, there is an accident, it's a, it's a, it's a quote from another presentation and a very interesting quote. It cannot sustain if it cannot uh, kind of uh, validate. So um, a beautiful coincidence that I have this from the previous presentation. And uh, my story is about uh, Free Riga, actually. Free Riga is this uh, local placemaking giant and trailblazers. And they started their uh, placemaking activities in 2013. And they are very much connected to what Lastadia is today. And it all started 
in uh, 2013, uh, when my good friend, where good friends of mine, uh, decided to point out uh, vacant houses, and they wanted to impress people by saying that we can do something else with vacant houses. And in 2014, when Riga was the capital of culture, they uh, made these stickers and they put them on every single vacant house in the city, saying that we have a problem. And it turned out that by now they have uh, revitalized six locations and more than 40,000 square meters. And uh, these are just some of the locations with the quote again. And uh, you might ask me a question, where is the where is the sixth location? And the sixth location is this beautiful place. It's called Lastadia. And it is a community garden, also a cultural space and do-it-yourself center. And uh, it all didn't look like this a few years ago. Actually, many, many, many years ago, it wasn't even like a proper place. Although a lot of people consider it being the very first um, neighborhood, the very first suburb of Riga, before we even had suburbs on 14th century. And the name of Lastadi comes from Last, which is uh, German for cargo. And it was affiliated with harbor, poor, non-Latin speaking community, crime, labor, dilapidated housing. And, uh, and it was like that for many, many, many years and centuries. And then in 2015, the houses in Lastadia region caught an eye to the Free Riga guys. And the place was reborn in 2015 with, of course, several steps in 16th and 18th. And still, the place was affiliated with poor, non-Latvian speaking residents and crime. So it was a challenging space. Um, but the idea of the guys, they were not very rich guys. They were basically enthusiasts and non-governmental organizations. And they said, let's embody the ideals of the yourself culture. Let's use circular economy and placemaking methods to make this place alive again. And actually, they started not by creating the space, but by building the capacity of people. They started this last idea festival in 2016 that now is a spring and autumn event. Also, there's this harvest festival because a market is nearby. And the focus was on involving the local fragile community those poor, those uh, probably the people with not that great education, because they're also people, they're inhabitants of the city. And how can we get them in? How can we work together with what they are interested about? And this is where the first time the idea of a community garden arose. And uh, it grew very, very fast. And now uh, the, the gardening communicating is their main focus of uh, placemaking. And they are supported by Linsto Baltic real estate developers that own the space and, and also the locals that come and create and they're allowed to go there and the space is open for everyone. So it is truly a community garden, not a, a, a social garden or pub or, or kind of a social space. You can go there anytime and you can sometimes see some homeless people uh, waking up in the morning when you pass by to work. And they very much focus on one thing, which is gardening, which is learning the trade. Uh, of gardening, but they also very much focus on culture and communing, building a community, revitalizing the community that was once uh, Jewish, that was once Russian, and now it is multicultural and it's full with youth culture and alternatives and experiments. And now Last Daddy is home for 100 artists, residents, musicians, non-governmental organizations, very much focused on uh, uh, on 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 uh, biodiversity, which is the vegan culture, very much focused on uh, circular economy and do it yourself. And we, as a municipality, were not involved in developing this place, but we were involved in helping to develop this place. At first, we eased place making practice. A uh, long, long time ago, when Free Free Riga started working, they had this hurdle: how can we can convince owners of private property to give us space and then the city helped by lowering taxes so if you give your private property for a set of years you, you won't need to pay that many taxes so there's a benefit for you but also benefit for the placemakers and uh, we actually have a special uh, funds, two special funds for cultural programs and social integration that uh, last idea very much uses uh, from the city from the city's, city's funding mechanisms and we have involved the municipal police, uh, police in helping to redevelop the safety and security of the area. This picture actually is from 2016, when there was a municipal police station at Lastadi, and you could go there and you could say, what's wrong with the place? Where, where I don't feel safe? And probably you can help us. So it was probably the first time when we, when we learned that this thing works. 
And of course, we also try to uh, uh, make our own reincarnations of Lasta Adia, you know, some sort of a publicly owned uh, community gardens. And just to end this presentation with how the space looked in 2011, and uh, it's not a big change, but still a change. And I think the greatest achievement is that they have organized the sun as well in the picture, right? But um, some of you are going to see this place today, I hope, and you're going to see on your own. So uh, this is this is my story, my neighborhood, last idea. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's very inspirational. And uh, while we will uh, walk uh, afterwards uh, this uh, webinar to check last study, uh, how sunny is it today? Uh, I invite everybody in uh, Zoom webinar, please um, introduce yourself to each other um, and um, write messages like select everyone so that we also kind of form some kind of community here with you who are uh, remotely switching on to this event. Uh, I have already a couple of questions to both of you, so be prepared for some. Okay, good. You have a question, but let's let's wait with questions and give floor to Hege. Hege is calling in from Svalbard, uh, but uh, Hege herself is originally from Westfold, Norway, and uh, has long experience in sales and marketing. Um, and um, since 2020, she works as a business consultant in her own company and assists SMEs with application writing, project, project planning, and so on. And Hege also coordinates the culinary business network in Svalbard. And for those of you who are Googling where it is, Hege will shortly introduce you to that. And this uh, culinary business network Svalbard consists of restaurants, hotels, grocery stores, and local food producers. And uh, Hege is also currently involved in establishing a nursery on Svalbard. So Hege, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's really fun for me to be a part of this. Uh, and it's so nice to look at the two other presentations. A lot of greens and salads and a uh, nice environment. Uh, I'm happy to be here to tell you about Robert and my story about Svalbard Brewery, Distillery and Horticulture. Quite a fun combination, right? Uh, Svalbard is uh, located very close to the North Pole. Uh, it's actually closer to the North Pole and it, it's to the mainland of Norway. You can come here and visit us by plane all year round, uh, or you can use a cruise ship during the summer season. We live in Longyearbyen. Uh, we are approximately 2,400 people living here from um, more than 50 uh, nationalities through to the Svalbard treatment. And we have uh, around between 70, 100,000 visitors that want to come and see our island um, per year. Uh, today's food situation in Longyearbyen, close to the North Pole, is that we have a very little local uh, food supply. Uh, we have some fishing, some reindeer, uh, but uh, most of the uh, island are snow, ice and rocks, so that's not very much local produce, production. Uh, of course, we have the local uh, brewery that makes beer and mineral water. But everything else we need to live up here needs to be taken uh, up from the mainland, either by boat or by plane. Uh, we have one grocery store that has an, a big emergency, where, uh, a big warehouse where they have dry milk, dry food, uh, nappies, toilet pepper, everything we need. Uh, but everything else uh, will come to the island either by boat or by plane. So if you want fresh herbs, salads, uh, dairies, uh, it's plain born to Longyearbyen and not very sustainable. A small look at uh, the history. Uh, Robert uh, is the founder of this uh, and he is a man of many great ideas. Uh, back in 2019, he wanted to um, establish a brewery in Longyearbyen. Uh, but the Norwegian law said that it was not allowed to make alcohol in, in Svalbard. So he made an application, made a phone call to the government every month for four, five years before they changed the law. 
So now he could establish his brewery. He has always been very eager to tell the story about Longyearbyen and about Svalbard. Their story from polar expeditions and hunting into an international center for research and knowledge. And also to tell and make people uh, be attentional for the vulnerable corner of this world. So everything we do up here is uh, done to take care of as much as we can take care of the environment and this vulnerable uh, corner of the world. And the future. Uh, Svalbard and Longyearbyen has their 120 years history of coal mining that will come to an end in a couple of years. So we see a lot of changes in the Svalbard society where we need to find new kinds of jobs. We need to uh, make our, us living up here more sustainable. And we need to do that with uh, incorporation with scientists to find the best way of doing that. The project is that we want to make a joint facility for Svalbard Brewery that needs more space. They are expanding and they are starting their export to Europe. So soon you will find uh, Svalbard brewed beer, for example, in Germany. And we also see that to be more sustainable, we can make our own uh, greens and vegetables up here instead of taking them by plane. This will be quite an unique uh, site. So we also want to um, make an exhibition center. We, we can share our knowledge and tell our story for the visitors that come up, comes up here. So uh, as we said, uh, it's really important for us to have very high focus on uh, making a green industry and the circular economy. So we want to develop that new green solutions that fits into the Arctic environment. Uh, looking at all the waste we make as people living up here, how to see that as a resource to make energy for a greener production. Uh, so just a sh short image of what we are thinking of. We see that everything we need, we are taking up to Svalbard with boat and plane, and all the waste we are making, we are taking down to the mainland for uh, taking care of down at the mainland, we're taking that down by boat. So uh, when Wilbert uh, started his brewery, he had this waste from the brewery production. That's it, okay, I have to take this by boat down to the mainline. That's expensive, it's not very sustainable. How can we do this in a better way? So he uh, bought a dryer and an oven uh, and uh, burned the waste to make energy. And then he get too much energy. So he said, okay, we can use this energy and this warm water and the th things we have from uh, making the uh, beers into a greenhouse. That's where the idea came. So we are looking in every angle to see what kind of green energy we can use to make uh, run both the brewery and the horticulture. So we will have fresher local produced greens for our citizens. So the way forward, now we are kind of mapping what we need, uh, how to do this the best way, what kind of expertise and knowledge do we need? How can we uh, find partners and uh, grandings that can make this come true in the best way? Uh, for the uh, indoor gardening and for the, we're thinking of starting out with uh, container farming, uh, and to fit that into the Arctic environment up here. And then uh, step number two will be making this new production facility, but uh, have all the participants or, or the, um, well, the brewery and the distillery, uh, the exhibition center all in one place. So uh, we are in a mapping and pre-projecting uh, phase, uh, and hopefully we will have our first um, container farm uh, up here in a year. 
So as I said, uh, this is a uh, cold and vulnerable society. We see that climate change very uh, good up here. So ev everything we do, we need to be uh, very uh, focused on the energy circulation and, and the way to do things as best as possible. And also to bring uh, fresh herbs, greens and salads into uh, the local community and to the people that live there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hege. Very interesting insights. Um, and now the question time. <laughs> but uh, let me first ask Malma. Let's start with the questions from public. So uh, for you, the question is the following. Is there any examples or stories of stories with people getting the feeling of succeeding? You mentioned the unemployed who are part of your unemployed people who, who are part of the Dodo's activities. So um, is there a story of people getting the feeling of success through this urban agriculture? Mm. Yeah, I can't come to think about anything like specific now, but, but especially like, yeah, these um, urban dinners that we arranged that are also like, uh, like free and open, like we had last they are every other Tuesday. So last Tuesday, one, and now in summer, we have them in the greenhouse. So we get like uh, food, um, surplus food from a local um, store. And then we also have harvest from our garden and together prepare this to a dinner. So like this, like um, community or getting together, eating together. And then um, often it's combined then with a discussion or presentation of, of something. So we heard about this, um, Plant Clan, which is a new um, new uh, community garden in Helsinki, like starting up. So, like, yeah, these uh, like yeah gatherings are like kind of uh, one way to also see like yeah like this empowerment of like we did this food, like we we harvested the greens, we cooked together, and now here we are like eating eating together and like yeah then meeting up and discussing and having these connections. So yeah, this I see very strongly as that. Yeah. So the connections as a success, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the other question, uh, I think uh, maybe to you, Martin, uh, uh, how can one reach out to those in the society that could need a community like this, like La Stade or Dodo, but struggle with finding it? So it's maybe to both of you. You mean, how can the individuals reach for communities like that? Yeah, Is... Reach out to the, and inform about existence of such communities. I, um, I probably didn't get the question right, so I can probably give an answer to both sides. Um, for example, if you have a community like that and if you want to reach more people, then, uh, and especially if we are talking about a location like I defined, which is not the wealthiest location, which has a lot of uh, difficulties and it is a fragile community, then the only way how to reach the people is by slowly building a relationship. And that, that, that's it. And no one is saying it's fast. No one is saying it's easy. But it's the only way you can build trust. And it's the only way you can build sort of... Um, acceptance and, and it's the only way you can slowly kind of lure people in by giving them good examples of how to do things and how to do things better or, or, or easier that it's not hard but if you are someone um, living somewhere and looking for a community like that then I believe it's even it's even harder because most of the people don't really have time just to sit all day and, and google what kind of communities we have around and probably they don't have time to walk around because some of the peoples may have two or three jobs we don't know that so um that is a more difficult question to answer how me as an individual living in last area can find last area community um but again probably the question is just try try finding a place try probably asking around and and again it's a kind of a, the question of communication like even if, if, if even if you have five minutes free time 
during the day and even if you're tired but if you really have this sort of need for looking then um, and if it's a priority of yours I think you will find those five minutes somehow but of course it's easier for a community to find people rather mm -hmm. than people to find a community Thanks. So what's your opinion, Mom? Um, yeah, I think also like be, being there, out doing things and, and having something visible in the city also like attracts uh, like visitors and viewers and, and people then to find out more about what it is. And we've noticed that it helps to have like signs and more info, like also at site, not like that everything is just online. Like when, yeah. yeah, sure. We, we have uh, tried out a lot um, intentionally and unintentionally as as me as an individual or me as a part of organization or part of a city uh, city uh, part of an organization owned by the city we have tried the cultural planning aspect which is you have the liaison you have a mediator which is not a deputy which is not the organizational uh, part of organization but it's an artist or social worker that that his job is actually just go out and and show the good things, ask around. There was this guy, the Danish photographer, who was in last year, 20, you know, 30 years ago, and he took photos and a lot of people remembered him because he he was not pretentious. He just walked around, he talked with people, he didn't understand them. And by by just, you know, being on the same level, it helps them to understand that, you know, this is not an intruder. He really likes us, he's interested in us, in our imperfections. And then he takes us somewhere where they're doing great things. And that actually also works works well, well how to, you know, make people being interested in what you do. And of course, just doing things. Yeah. Just creating the community garden. That's it. Just doing things. And does the same thing hold true for you, Hege? Do you see that you have a local community interest in, in the brewery or how the things are evolving there, where it's probably very cold to walk very far? <laughs> <laughs> I think the local community is uh, really interesting. We are interested. We are living in a small place. A lot of people, it's not that difficult. We know each other. Uh, we don't have any greens. We don't have any trees here. Uh, a lot of people uh, tries to uh, grow things inside. So we have this group that groups that meets. Uh, to share uh, how to grow hydroponic. That is the almost the only way to do things up here. Uh, because we have sun 24 seven, six months uh, in a year, and that's too much sun. And then we have completely darkness for three months. That is, you have to have uh, other light sources. So I think that we also see that uh, when we talk about our project, everyone is like, okay, how can we do this into uh, knowledge sharing? Can we involve the schools and the students to have their corner in the greenhouse? Um, and everybody wants like, the, can't we make this green restaurant? We can come in and feel some greenery around us. So uh, yes, absolutely. I think green things make something with people. They like to have that around them. Thank you. And then the, the question about seasonality. Uh, maybe it's very different in Svalbard, but in general, when we think about these spaces and the seasonality, uh, do urban gardens bring back the sense of seasonality? And do we need this sense? Or do we want to eat greeny leaves all year round? And... Uh, what happens with urban gardens when the sea, there is no season, so no off season? Do they become like abandoned places until something can grow again? Uh, how does it look like for you, Mom? Um, yeah, I think it's important uh, like to to connect with the like um, the seasons and the rhythm of of the seasons. Um, though the off season isn't really that. Uh, short like depending what you grow you can also plan so that you have things to harvest even like in in November uh, before the snows uh, even like uh, you can have plants you can like dig out from from the snow and and then again uh, it's good to have some time to plan the following season and and things like chilies you can already start to pre-grow uh, in December so uh, even then, 
in, in January, February, March, when there's quite some snow in Helsinki, we are still already uh, pre-growing things for the following season and planning the following season. So yeah, the, the rhythm is there still and uh, the absence and abundance of light, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but, but it all ties in, like there's different things to do different times of the year. Thanks. And uh, Martin, how do you see the seasonality aspect? I think it's very intense. You you literally see when it starts and when it ends, especially when I have community gardens like that. that uh, but I think a lot of people don't, uh, I think a lot of people have a sentiment that they're really, really looking forward to see this place green again in spring. But because of the last idea in doing a lot of cultural work and doing a lot of activities unrelated to gardening, it makes the place live and makes the, um, makes the community long for the garden back again. And I think they do also a lot of activities already in February and March indoors when there are potting activities and that you r literally can plant your own uh, little things on your own. And, and that is actually a nice start before the snow melts you you plant your your little your little seeds and then when the spring comes you can plant you can plant them in the ground immediately and i think the kind of a practical preparation is a, a way to prolong the seasonality but um, but i think a lot of people in the community in last idea they very much are unhappy when when the place is closed for that kind of gardening and, and meeting and they're waiting for spring to come there is also saying that there are two different Latvias or Rigas, one in summer season, the other in winter season, very different country. Uh, how about Svalbard and seasonality? So but basically, as I understand, you want to bring the eternal spring <laughs> to Svalbard <laughs> or, or summer, early summer. <laughs> you know, all the, due to the environment up here, all the growing will be indoors. Uh, so uh, it will not be that big of change during the year, but I see that a lot of people like to kind of get the spring feeling by uh, buying more greens, uh, buying more, uh, growing more uh, in the springtime than during when it gets close to winter. Probably having picnics. <laughs> we have um, barbecue seasons on the ice. So that's like ideas uh, pop up. And then the next question is um, uh, how, how to promote this involvement and inclusivity? Is it just for those with green uh, like skills of gardening or, or what, what other kind of inclusion mechanisms are out there to get people involved in these you communities? Mean the green fingers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the very first, especially if we talk about communities like that and gardens like that and places like that, the very first, unrelated to what you represent is to level with the place. You can't go there and be the conquistador. You need to be with the people, with the people's level, so they'd speak the same language. And uh, and Lastadi does it very well, but Lastadi, like I said, they involve a lot of do-it-yourself or upcycling culture, and a lot of those people really have a lot of stuff at home that they don't use uh, or they still use because they can't buy anything new or they don't want to buy anything new. So a lot of people that have creative minds, they kind of come together and, and use that kind of material and they speak with people and find out what they're interested in. So I think the creative atmosphere of Last Idea gives this vast, there's a plethora of things that you can do. You, they they have cooking lessons that you can bring your own stuff that you buy in the in 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 uh, in, in a shop where you've grown and you can make pizzas, uh, and you can make uh, vegan uh, shashlik, and and then you can come um, with the trash that you have and try to make some sort of a kind of an urban sculpture and things like that. So uh, during the years, they have also learned that a lot of people in the community, they have special skills. They have, they have trained for something long, long time ago. And now they have a possibility to do that. So um, yes, I think level with people and also let them do whatever they want to do if someone can learn from that. Some kind of creative platform. Uh, Mom, do you have something to add here? 
what was the question again <laughs> uh, yeah the, how to uh, like um, manage this or increase involvement and inclusivity is this just through the gardening or the other kind of skills that martin's just kind of provided yeah. this creative spaces where you can probably make something of wood <laughs> flower boxes or anything like yeah different. yeah i think the the social uh, connections are like one very important one and then like we've noticed that like this like kind of celebrations celebrating the harvest and yeah we have also in, in spring like kind of starting the the season and and one thing what we have in in finland is called talkot so these like work parties like getting together doing something together so like um and this is also yeah, we also have talk in Latvian, so we even share linguistically uh, this word. How about festivals, festivities, new traditions or rituals in Svalbard? Do you also have some kind of uh, festivities based, maybe some Oktoberfest there? <laughs> I'm looking forward to making festivals out of uh, the, the green of the vertical garden. Uh, actually, uh, in that sort of way, Longyearbyen is a really living community. I normally say it's a big city in a small scale. We have a lot of uh, creative people up here with the blues festivals, jazz festivals, literature festivals, and the food festival in October. Uh, so we have actually a lot of people that are really engaged in different kind of cultural activities. Thanks. And uh, just continuing this, that you need to level up or somewhat involve and open this uh, creative space. Another kind of side of this coin is um, myth or stereotypes or misinformation that you have to, in a way, somewhat, somewhat combat about food or gardening as such. And uh, maybe in this light, can you come up with an urban myth about urban gardens and challenge that urban myth? something that's stuck in the minds and then you someone have to say well urban gardening is something different mom yeah yeah i can add this so in in finnish um urban gardening is kaupunkiviljely so like kind of city cultivation and and especially like around 10 years ago there was a lot of the notion that yeah so the city is growing people uh, food for people in the city so then these small like box gardens had the challenge uh, because many of them, there was like people having their like kind of private boxes that they rented for the season. And then to explain like, yeah, it's it's these these people who are growing food here in the city. It's not the city growing for the inhabitants. So then like signage helped. But but then, of course, there's always somebody maybe uh, taking some harvest, but still like information. Uh, because one one reason is that the city, yeah, they still have that they grow like sunflowers and peas out on fields, and and there the citizens can freely collect. Same with some uh, apple orchards have like these picking events. Uh, so so to kind of teach or like this new term, getting like this urban gardening more more known has been one challenge. Uh, the, yeah, I think around 10 years ago, it was more of a challenge than now. Thanks. So you have to understand that it's not city that's growing for you food, but you need to do something yourself mm -hmm. to grow it. And also that milk doesn't grow into the Tetra packs, probably some kind of discoveries on the way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, do you also have an urban myth? I think I have two. Uh, one of them is related to the Latvian worldview which is only the real garden only the real farm is outside of cities right mm -hmm. when you do something in cities that's not real that's <laughs> uh that's blasphemy and uh, as we as latvians all of us there's always this sort of a tendency to disappear from cities and weekends are doing uh, celebrations we all these we all have these gardens in the countryside these uh, countryside houses and huts and and if you don't have it, you know someone and then you visit them. So you don't do gardening in city. But it's changing because when you look at the numbers, you, you see that one third of a country lives in Riga and then probably two thirds live in urban or even more than two thirds live in urban environments. So why would you rob yourself of building a better location where you live instead of waiting for weekends and just 
spend around the green area for one and a half day. So I think that is one of the myths that we need to understand that it's okay to have gardens in a city. And the other myth is that it should, it definitely is polluted, right? It, it, it is polluted, right? You can't eat a berry from uh, an urban garden because most likely you will die in agony and, and everything bad is going to happen. But then you, but you, then you realize that um, probably there are cities that have bad conditions. But but if we talk about Riga, it's it's not that bad of a location to grow things. We have multiple gardens in in Lutzalsala, and there are huge spaces where people grow their own food. I know them for years. The only kind of side effect that they have from growing food is they have become happier. Uh, probably it's contagious. I don't know. Probably you can get that from you know urban berries, but uh, but they've been doing it for for tens of years and they still are very happy about it and it hasn't affected their their, their health. And um, so yeah, I think you know practice and trial, uh, trial and error, is some sort of a way to prove that that um, urban gardening is just as healthy or probably unhealthy as buying plastic food from supermarkets so i don't know who's to say yeah and also i i know that there is also like if you explore the quality of honey that is gathered in the urban spaces frequently it's even better because it avoids all the pesticides that are out there in the agricultural lands so uh thanks for those insights and um Hege, do you have also some urban myth there up there i'm i'm very glad that martin had two <laughs> but i think that uh i just think that uh, i think it's so great like the focus and the ideas of urban farming has developed so much during the last 10 years i just remember the when I started to my B project, when I was working in the mainland with the, the gardening industry in Norway, uh, it was bit like B project and urban farming was a bit for strangers. Now, even big uh, builders that build are thinking of how to make green small gardens and how to make things uh, put uh, in the right way so people can use it for urban gro growing sites. So that's, I think the changes is great. Thanks. Mom, you wanted to share some of more uh, urban myths or? No, maybe it's, but you yeah, have something. I had a question. Yeah. I had a question to you. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot of, uh, of involving flora, but have you thought of uh, involving fauna in your work, except for bees? Like and working with animals, urban animals, or, or trying to find ways how to include them in your work, um, not only plants. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so a short, short answer is no, okay. and longer answer is that I know uh, there's this one a garden called uh, the Edible Park that Dora was earlier involved in, and and now it's under the uh, city youth department in Helsinki. Uh, there's been like uh, summer chickens for I think five, six years now. Um, it's a, yeah, it's an edible park. So it is like um, uh, area um, out on an island in Helsinki where there's both like a community garden and then this youth work. So like the uh, uh, young people are having a summer cafeteria there and there's courses for both school children and then um, uh, youngsters in the summer. So, so here there's like a, this uh, um, urban like hens and, and one rooster. <laughs> the, the last year the, the chicken like were picking on it. So they had to um, take the, back the, the rooster to its winter home. So they always get from the same, same form like chickens out there. And then depending a bit on the chickens, how, how well they are grouped, they can also go around. Um, in the garden but yet yeah, no we, uh, as it's um we don't have like kind of it's all on concrete and asphalt so uh the the place wouldn't be practical for having chicken out there or or other animals yeah but but i know that there is still in helsinki like and there's also an interest uh, of having like a few few chickens um also in um like um, what is it? detached houses and like and backyards 
and that is a possibility like and okay. so there's legislation that makes it possible to do so yeah yeah i think and maybe uh, of bird houses and, and you know bird you know, putting bird bird houses on, on, on trees on, on top of your roof uh, maybe it would attract a few extra sparrows or, or starlings yeah. or something like that yeah yeah those are the more like a challenge in the greenhouse that they come and pick on the tomatoes same with rats um, uh, and other rodents that they like rumble around in the greenhouse so that means you're doing something right yeah, it means yeah. that it's very attractive not only for us it's yeah. it's, it's an appealing to all species yeah, so do we have some questions from the audience here, the keynote speakers? Yes, Luciana? Uh, yes, thank you so much for such a nice presentation. I think it was very inspiring as well. I'm amazed about like the longevity of like both, yeah, Dodo and then also here in Riga, like 10 years of like kind of uh, this organization and then capitalizing like in people's, in, in people's life and then bringing people together. Uh, I have a question to uh, Martin about, you mentioned that municipality does not get involved, but just gives support. Uh, which I think is amazing, actually, because I think it is a kind of empowerment as well, like for the civil society, for people to organize themselves. But then uh, you mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, that your support is about how to convince owners to give a space then for people. And then I, I'm wondering about um, if how has been this kind of incentive? And this is one question. And then I have another question also like to Hege, because I think it's uh, uh, also amazing. Like, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's okay. It's uh, uh, it's amazing also like all this uh, entrepreneurship like in this uh, you know like a uh, spot of the world like very much like sparsely populated and very isolated and I I I, I think I can, I can feel like the passion as well like in making this work and I'm wondering about I think the brewery is already a victory and I'm just thinking about how is it now. The, the plans for the, the implementation of the greenhouse, if you have already like some kind of a funding or if you have like being involved with like to find, uh, yeah, how is the stage of development of uh, uh, the implementation of this greenhouse? Uh, so I, get, I, can answer, I can answer first. Um, um, at first, uh, I just wanted to uh, make it more clear that we are not in, involved in this place. We have our own community gardens. Actually, we've learned from this. So we have created our own first version and we're thinking of other versions. So um, so that there's that. And, and another thing is that sometimes we can't do such activities because of one very stupid reason, capacity. We, I, I work with Regis Measure, which is this uh, organization that works with the greenery uh, of, of the city. And they say, we simply have no people of doing a lot of things. We, we need to organize the basics and then, and, and even that we can barely do. So we need more people. Thank you. Please, please, please move to Riga. We, we have a job. Um, but as for, as for the success of supporting such activities, for example, placemaking, uh, we have an example of one of the uh, houses that Free Riga mm, had, and it was located in the quiet center. We have this area that is very posh and look luxurious. All the money lives there, a lot of people say. And they had this uh, four-story building from the 1930s, and it was not in a good condition. There were people that lived there until they died. So all of the package they had, all of the things they have accumulated, they needed to clean. Um, but they did great art projects at that. I also did a trash museum there, which was the, the, the trash there. It was full of treasure. But they had an agreement with the owners for a year. And they stayed for more than, uh, almost two years. So Odin's liked the idea. And when they moved out to another location, it took around two years for the owner to sell the building completely. And now it's reconstructed, renovated, and it's sold out. And that was just a great example that this is how you create a good atmosphere of the space and you can very easily use it. Uh, we now have a challenge, again, probably because of capacity, how to revitalize places that are that the warehouses before and now they're just uh, parking lots made on, 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 on spaces where the houses were torn down. 
and we want them to be revitalized as these kind of a small public spaces, these little green pockets. And again, we just need to find out the the way how we can create an incentive where the owners give the space out for some time so people can just hang around. We can probably put some benches in there so people can sit there. But then again, we do not have a very precise legislation. Can we do? Can, can we put benches and, 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 and seating uh, on private property? So I think we need to sort that sort of thing out rather than just uh, asking people to, to give their little small lots that are not overbuilt with something for, for, the, for the greenery, for public space. So, but again, not, not only Rigas Meiji have lack of capacity, we also do. And we have great ideas that we simply cannot achieve because we don't have that many people. And we have few vacancies at work. So you can come and work with us and you can apply for it, but we don't have actually no one to apply for. And we have raised the wages so that the competition is better, better, but we only have that many people in the city as, as we have. And, and uh, we can't do the Estonian way. We have a lot of physical things to, to work with and, and uh, a lot of you know, peer to peer, social to social things, and we cannot make everything digital in this case. So let's see how we can do, uh, how we can do in future. Okay, now I try to remember the question. <laughs> uh, I think you were asking on where we are at the moment and how to, uh, how to move forward in our project. Uh, as you said, the brewery is a success. They need more space. They want to develop further. Uh, everything, you shouldn't think so, but even though it's a big island and we just have 2,400 people living here, it's uh, one of the biggest challenges is due to regulations, uh, I get a proper area to develop. Uh, and also we have uh, really high construction costs nearly 40% higher than down in the mainland because everything has to be transported up here by boat. Uh, and also to get the right permissions, it's a long state processing time. But we are working close to with Innovation Norway and others to try to find good fundings to get started. And as I said, we are planning to start the farming uh, with the container farms and then uh, try to process this into a bigger plan to make this new production facility for all the tree activities and the production sites. So um, we are still working on mapping the cost levels and how to do this the best way, which kind of uh, sustainable energy solutions uh, are we gonna use and then go out and seek for, for fundings. Thank you both. I think great answers, also great questions. Uh, and um, so just to wrap up our webinar, uh, the call for action, what should be done today in a month, in a year to move forward with what you're doing? Uh, so mom, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, now it's a good good time to sow the seeds, seeds um, early spring. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the grounds have warmed up like, uh, so to yeah, sow something today and uh, in a year you can do the same so maybe something more uh, and until then you can also work on like yeah kind of showing these places that are around and showing them to your um, city municipality if you want to have something similar like look look for the, the examples because they are out there uh, not only these that we've seen, but also like, yeah, in the region, other places in Berlin, many places. Um, yeah, to because, yeah, as already mentioned in the previous webinar, that that is like good examples are also always good, something tangible to like present. Yeah. Get inspiration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Martin. I'm usually good at this, but I need more time. <laughs> Um, by, <laughs> no, 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 I will, I will, I will probably answer. I think my first call to action is let's just try talking to each other and, and let's just inspire each other. We, we, we know that we all have our, our difficulties and, 
and and we know that the city has limits and regulations but we can always find interesting solutions if we talk about them and and look on on upon other examples and um, more and more it turns out to be a very valuable thing just understanding each other and understanding how can we find a solution or a compromise in in the situations in situations Thank you. I thought it would be a great description of this webinar or the key idea, because that's why we are here to talk and share and, and inspire each other. And Hege, how does it look like for you? What should be done today, in a month, in a year? <laughs> uh, we are positive. We think we can do this. We want to do this. We see that this is uh, actually the best low-hanging fruit solution for Longyear being to be more, uh, have more local food supply. And we have a lot of support and a lot of people that are sharing for us. So we will use um, the next months to make all the business plans, tell people about our ideas and where we, how to move forwards, map everything. And hopefully uh, during the next year, we will have our first con container farm producing fresh salads in Longyearbyen. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, thank you, the keynote speakers for the insights and definitely inspiration. And um, look forward to probably look how far you have um, reached with your ideas in a year. That would be very interesting to see that. Let's, let's uh, keep our eyes open. And um, thank you so much. And the last webinar will be tomorrow at the Democracy Festival Lampa at one o'clock in the Nordic tent number 44. So thank you for participation. <laughs>